The sun is already warming the pavement when I step outside. It's one of those rare weekends where I don't have any plans, and the neighborhood's annual yard sale seems like the perfect way to spend it. A few blocks away, I can already hear the soft murmurs of haggling neighbors and the distant laughter of children playing. Walking closer, colorful stalls start to line the streets. The Jenkins from down the street are selling an array of old toys, probably trying to clear out before their youngest heads to college. Mrs. Rodriguez is displaying a beautiful collection of hand-knitted scarves and beanies, and she gives me a wave as I pass by. Next to her, the Thompson twins are attempting to sell their childhood bicycle. It's a tandem, the memories of them navigating and often crashing. That thing around the neighborhood brings a smile to my face. A few steps further, and I find Mr. Walters with his assortment of vintage records. He's passionately describing the glory of them to a group of teenagers who look half interested and half amused. Beside him, Mrs. Bailey displays her assortment of handmade jewelry. I spot a stand with old video game consoles, another with a collection of antique clocks, and even one with a beautiful assortment of porcelain dolls. I weave through the tables filled with old books, household items, and even a collection of mismatched dishes and cutlery. The air is filled with the scent of fresh baked goods, as Mrs. Patterson is selling her famous chocolate chip cookies at a stall, and they are selling out fast. As I continue to explore, something catches my eye. It's the glint of something old and slightly tarnished amidst a heap of other trinkets. Drawn to it, I find myself standing in front of a table that seems to be an eclectic mix of items, and there, half buried under a pile of old books and worn out toys, is a camera. My fingers instinctively reach out, brushing aside the dust-covered novels and faded board games, revealing the old camera in all its vintage glory. Its leather exterior is a bit worn, and the metal is slightly oxidized, but the lens is clear. Ah, I see you found the old camera, exclaims the stall owner, a woman with silver hair tied back. Her eyes are framed by lines that speak of countless smiles. She looks familiar, but I can't place her. It's beautiful, I say, cradling the camera in my hands, feeling its history and imagining the memories it must have captured. It belonged to my grandfather, she says with a nostalgic sigh. He was a photographer, traveled the world with that thing. He believed it had magic in it. I raise an eyebrow, intrigued. Magic? What do you mean? She chuckles. Maybe not the kind you're thinking of, but he said that camera had a way of capturing more than just pictures. It captured moments and feelings. He used to say it had a soul. I am taken aback by the sentiment. I've always loved the idea that objects, especially old ones, carry with them the stories of their previous owners. This camera, with its worn edges and the mystery of its history, feels like a treasure waiting to be rediscovered. How much is it? I ask, hoping it's within my budget. She seems to contemplate for a moment, then says, For you, $10? Only ten dollars for such a piece of history. That seems too little for something so precious, I say. She smiles warmly. It's not about the money, dear. It's about finding the right person to continue its story. My grandfather would have wanted it that way. I hand her a ten dollar bill. Thank you, I say. She nods, her eyes sparkling with a mix of sadness and hope. Take good care of it. And remember... It's not just about taking photos. It's about capturing memories. With the camera now safely tucked in my bag, I continue to wander through the yard sale, but with a newfound excitement. After a while, I decide to depart from the yard sale, eager to explore the camera's capabilities. My first stop is the local park. I carefully load the camera with some film I had at home, a stash I'd kept for an old photography project in high school. Adjusting the settings, I aim the lens at a group of children chasing after a frisbee. The camera clicks satisfyingly, and I feel a rush of exhilaration. I continue my photographic journey, taking shots of a man reading under a tree, a mother playing peekaboo with her baby, and a couple having a picnic. As the sun starts its descent, painting the sky in hues of orange and pink. I head towards the city's old bridge. The reflection of the setting sun on the water below provides a perfect backdrop.
Just as I'm about to take a shot, a gentle hand taps my shoulder. Turning around, I see Jake, an old friend from high school who I haven't seen in years. Emily, is that you? He asks, his eyes wide with surprise. Jake, I exclaim, wrapping him in a hug. It's been so long. He nods, his eyes landing on the camera hanging around my neck. Are you taking up photography? I nod, taking a moment to share the story of the yard sale. Jake's eyebrows rise in intrigue, his characteristic smirk revealing his interest. You always did have an eye for unique finds, he remarks, recalling the countless treasures I'd unearthed during our high school years from thrift stores and garage sales. Jake looks at the camera. Mind if I join you on this photo spree? He asks. Of course not. I exclaim, thrilled by the idea. It'll be just like old times. And so we begin winding our way through the city streets. The golden hour casts a warm, ethereal glow, highlighting the city's beauty. Jake points out a street performer, and the setting sun illuminates his silhouette as he juggles flaming torches. The camera clicks in my hands, immortalizing the sight. Over the next hour, Jake and I walk through the city's streets and alleyways, with every turn and corner, we find new moments to capture. We chat, laugh, and sometimes just enjoy the quiet serenity of a particular setting. Eventually, the winding mechanism of the camera offers resistance, signaling the end of the film roll. As the evening shadows grow longer, Jake and I find ourselves back where we began. With a warm, lingering hug, we part ways, and promises of catching up again soon hang in the air between us. The following morning, I'm awoken by the morning sun seeping through the blinds, illuminating my room with a soft golden hue. As I stretch, memories of the previous day flood back and a wave of excitement courses through me. The sensation of using the old camera, its weight in my hands, the mechanical clicks. It had been a nostalgic experience, a throwback to my time in high school photography class. Now. As I think about the undeveloped film nestled within its body, my heart races with anticipation. Walking over to my living room, I glance at the corner I've repurposed into a mini dark room. A large blackout curtain is pulled back, revealing the meticulously set up space. I move closer, feeling the cool tiles under my feet, and switch on the dim red safety light. Its soft glow casts an eerie ambiance. I take a deep breath and the unique scent of the chemicals fills my nostrils. Laying out the necessary equipment, I methodically pour the developer into a tray, followed by the stop bath and fixer in separate trays. With everything set, I gently extract the film from the camera, ensuring not to expose it to any stray light. The sudden knock on my door jolts me from my concentration. I'm not expecting anyone, and for a brief moment I wonder if I should just ignore it. But the knock comes again, more persistent this time. I carefully place the film on the counter and head to the door. Pulling it open, I met with Jake's friendly grin. Hey, thought I'd swing by. Figured you'd be knee-deep in the photo developing process, he says, holding up a bag of freshly ground coffee beans. I brought reinforcements, he adds with a wink. Grateful for the pleasant interruption, I step aside, allowing him in. Perfect timing. I could use a good cup right now, I admit, motioning for him to head to the kitchen. Jake wastes no time, quickly filling my space with the sounds of coffee preparation, the gush of water, the clinking of mugs, and the soft hum of the coffee maker. Within moments, the rich, intoxicating aroma of brewing coffee permeates the room, chasing away the harsh smell of the chemicals. How's the developing going? He inquires after a while, peeking over the kitchen counter towards my makeshift darkroom. Just about done. I call out from my corner as I slide the film into the developer solution. Thanks for dropping by. It's nice to have company during this part. As the coffee brews, our conversation drifts to our plans for the day and other mundane topics. After what feels like mere moments, it's time to extract the film and hang the negatives to dry. I pin them up, but as they dangle, something catches my eye. The images displayed don't match what we captured yesterday. A sense of unease bubbles up, and I squint, trying to make sense of what I'm seeing. Jake notices my puzzled expression. Is everything okay? He asks, handing me a mug of coffee. Taking a sip, I try to organize my thoughts. I don't know. These images, they aren't what we shot yesterday. It's almost like they've changed. 
Jake arches an eyebrow, with intrigue evident on his face. Changed? How? I can't put my finger on it yet, I say, my voice filled with uncertainty. Let's wait for the full prints. Maybe it's just an odd quirk of this old camera. Jake nods, seemingly as invested in this mystery as I am. Together, we await the final results and our anticipation is now mixed with a touch of apprehension. The subtle sound of the enlarger breaks the silence in my makeshift darkroom as I carefully align each negative. The room is bathed in the soft glow of the red light, casting everything in a muted, surreal hue. With every passing second, the blank paper underneath begins to reveal the images. The outlines are faint at first, then they become increasingly sharper. But as the pictures emerge, the exhilaration of seeing my work materializes into a heavy knot of confusion in my stomach. The scenes coming to life aren't the ones I remember capturing. The bustling streets, the amber-tinted skies of the sunset, and the candid moments, they're nowhere to be found. Instead, with an unsettling consistency, each photograph unveils the same haunting structure, an old house, long abandoned, with its paint peeling, windows shattered, and nature slowly reclaiming it. What's more puzzling is that each image portrays the house at a distinct time. Dawn, high noon, twilight, and midnight. I gather the finished prints and my hands tremble slightly. I arrange them side by side on my living room table. The progression of the house through time is eerie almost as if it's trying to convey a narrative of its own. Jake, can you get over here? I call out, choked by the unsettling discovery. I desperately need a second pair of eyes, someone to confirm I'm not losing my mind. Hearing the urgency in my voice, Jake abandons his coffee and strides over. The jovial look on his face evaporates as his eyes scan the series of images. He slowly bends down, examining each photo with growing disbelief. We didn't take these, he murmurs, looking up at me with widened eyes. Nodding, I run my fingers through my hair, trying to make sense of the impossible. I don't get it. We were together all day. How can all the shots be of this house? Why is this happening? He takes a deep breath, rubbing his temples. Could it be some kind of double exposure? Or maybe someone tampered with the film? I lean against the table, feeling the weight of the mystery. Taking a deep breath, I reach for the first photograph and hold it under the brighter light of the room. I trace the perimeter of the house with my finger, coming to rest at a spot that appears marginally darker than its surroundings. The dark silhouette is barely perceptible, but once seen it's impossible to ignore. It's as if someone tried to blend into the shadows just a faint outline that almost resembles a human form. The second image captured at noon showcases the house under the brightness of midday. The sun overhead illuminates every worn out brick and shattered window. But the figure is now closer to the house, standing near an old, decaying tree. Though bathed in sunlight, its form is oddly dark, as if the light doesn't touch it. It remains shadowy, and its face is still hidden, but its posture suggests it's facing the camera. In the third photo, taken at twilight, the setting sun paints the sky in hues of purple and gold. The house, now in semi-darkness, adds to the overall eeriness of the scene. The figure is even closer than before, standing right at the house's entrance. It's here that its shape becomes more defined. A long flowing cloak or robe seems to drape from its shoulders, and although it's still enigmatic, a suggestion of hands, or perhaps claws, can be seen extending forward. The last image, shot at midnight, is the most haunting. The house is almost lost in the encompassing darkness, illuminated only by the faint glow of moonlight. Right in front of the camera, and dwarfing the house behind it, the figure looms. It feels menacing in its closeness, its form now unmistakably human, but still cloaked in shadows. No distinct features can be discerned, yet its very presence in this photo feels intensely personal and threatening. 
Jake and I sit in silence for a moment. Our eyes are fixed on the photos laid out before us. The weight of what we're seeing presses down on the room, making the air feel thick. I can't believe this, I mutter, my voice barely more than a whisper. Jake nods, his face pale. I shake off the chilling feeling and force myself to focus. We need to figure this out, starting with this house. I point to the decaying structure that stands as the backdrop in each photo. It's got to be real, right? Maybe if we find it, we'll get some answers. Jake rubs his temples. It's a start. The house looks old, but not ancient. I'm sure we can find out about its history. Jake and I settle down at my small dining table, laptops open and ready. We begin by searching for old houses in our area, hoping that something resembling the one in the photos pops up in the results. We start broadly, searching through historic home databases and forums where locals share urban legends and tales of old buildings. While we come across several interesting stories, none of them lead us to the house we are seeking. Next, we focus our search more locally, combing through neighborhood blogs and social media groups. It's here that we stumble upon a thread discussing old, forgotten structures in our region. One user has shared a series of images of houses that have been abandoned for years. I click through them rapidly until finally I freeze. There it is. The image on the screen is unmistakably the house in our photos, the same broken windows and worn walls with an overgrown yard. The post mentions that it's a house that has stood empty for decades with its original owners long gone. Its exact location isn't mentioned, but a few users hint at it being located on the outskirts of the town in a now desolate and mostly forgotten area. Excitement bubbles up within me, mixing with a sense of fear. Jake, look, I exclaim, pointing at the image on the screen. Jake leans in, his eyes widening as he recognizes the house. It's the same. It has to be. We found it. I nod. We have a lead, at least. We should go there and see it for ourselves. Maybe we'll find something that explains these photos and that figure. Jake agrees, and we quickly jot down the information available about the location. We grab a few essentials, flashlights, a camera, and some bottled water, and head out. The local landmark mentioned in the forum post acts as our starting point. From there, a trail, more overgrown than not, winds its way through the thick woods. As we walk, every rustle in the trees and every distant animal sound adds to the atmosphere of growing anticipation. After what feels like hours, but is probably closer to one, the woods start to thin, and in a clearing ahead, the house emerges. It's eerily silent as we step out of the tree line and take in the sight before us. The house is grander than the photos could depict, even in its decayed state. The exterior, once probably a bright white, is now peeling and gray, scarred by the elements and time. Broken windows stare blankly at us, like dark, vacant eyes. The porch, which runs the width of the house, is sagging in places, and the front door hangs crookedly on its hinges. The lawn has given way to wild growth, with tall grasses and weeds. Old, gnarled trees with their branches devoid of leaves stand around the house, casting long, twisted shadows that dance with the breeze. Jake breaks the silence. It's even more creepy in person, he murmurs. I nod in agreement, feeling a chill despite the warm day. And it feels, I don't know, alive? Like it's watching us. He glances at me, clearly feeling the same sensation. We should be quick. Take a look around, see if we can find any clues about that figure in the photos. Together, we approach the house. The creaking sound of the front porch accompanies our cautious steps as Jake and I make our way to the entrance. Taking a deep breath, I reach for the doorknob, feeling the cold metal against my skin. With a slow creak, the door opens, revealing the house's interior. The first thing we notice is the dust. It's everywhere, 
creating a thin veil over every surface and floating in the air, catching the stray beams of sunlight streaming through the broken windows. Wallpaper hangs in tattered strips, revealing the old wood beneath. The floor, covered in layers of grime and dirt, groans under our weight as we slowly step inside. To our left is what appears to have been the living room. There are faded remnants of furniture, a couch with its stuffing exposed, a toppled over bookshelf, and a broken coffee table. The fireplace, though cold and unused for years, still has remnants of charred wood. Jake motions towards a doorway leading off the living room. This looks like the dining room, he says. We step through and find a long wooden table. Its surface is also covered in a thick layer of dust. But what captures our attention are the photographs spread out across the table. The photos are old, their edges are curled and the colors are faded, but the images on them are clear. The first shows a happy family, two adults and three children, smiling and posing in front of the very house we're standing in. Another depicts a young woman, possibly one of the daughters, standing by a tree with the house in the background. Yet in each of these pictures, a familiar sight sends shivers down my spine. The same shadowy figure from our photos stands at a distance. Jake picks up one of the photos as his hands tremble slightly. Emily, look at this, he says, pointing to an image of the house's front yard. It's a gathering, perhaps a birthday or some celebration with children playing and adults chatting. And there, right at the edge of the photo, is the shadowy figure, its form slightly more distinct, but still mysterious. It's... It's been here for a long time, I murmur, my voice barely audible. As Jake and I prepare to move further into the house, a faint sound freezes us in place. It's subtle, almost drowned out by the ambient creaking of the old structure, but unmistakable. Footsteps. They're coming from the floor above us. We exchange a glance. Jake gestures upwards, mouthing the word, upstairs. The notion that we aren't alone in this decaying house sends a chill down my spine. Could it be an animal? I whisper, clutching the photos closer to my chest. Jake shrugs slightly. Maybe, he says. But those sounded like... human footsteps. Every instinct is telling me to leave, to get out of the house and away from the unknown source of the noise. But our desire to unravel the mystery of the photos of the shadowy figure keeps us determined. Jake picks up a broken chair leg from the floor, holding it in a defensive stance. Stay close, he murmurs. Taking a collective breath, we move towards the staircase and the worn wooden steps groan under our weight. As we reach the top of the staircase, the footsteps stop. The sudden silence is almost jarring, making the atmosphere even more tense. But the quiet is short-lived. Faint whispers begin to fill the air. The words are imperceptible, but the tone conveys a sense of urgency. Jake and I step onto the landing, scanning the dimly lit hallway that stretches out before us. There are doors on either side, most of them closed, with the peeling paint and tarnished doorknobs hinting at the room's long-abandoned status. The whispering seems to come from all directions, yet it's impossible to pinpoint its exact source. Do you hear that? I ask quietly. Jake nods. Yeah. It's like voices, but I can't make out what they're saying. The whispers intensify as we move further down the hallway, drawn to one door that is slightly ajar. With a look of shared determination, Jake and I approach it. Gently, I push the door open wider, revealing a room that appears to have been a child's bedroom. Faded wallpaper with playful designs covers the walls, and old toys and books are scattered about. In the center of the room is an old rocking chair, and it's moving, slowly rocking back and forth, though there's no one sitting in it. The whispers are loudest here, swirling around us like a cold breeze. Feeling too creeped out to stay in that room just one more second, we leave the unsettling atmosphere of the children's room behind 
and continue to explore the second floor. Every creak of the wooden floor beneath our feet amplifies the tension. The whispering has subsided, but the silence that's replaced it feels just as oppressive. We enter what must have once been a master bedroom. Faded drapes hang limply from the windows. An old wardrobe stands against one wall, its mirror reflecting our anxious faces. Next, we move to what appears to be a study. Shelves line the walls, still filled with books that show signs of age and decay. An old typewriter sits on a desk, with a sheet of yellowed paper still threaded through it. But like the master bedroom, this room, too, offers no answers. Taking a deep breath, we approach the final room at the end of the hallway. Hesitating for just a moment, then we push open the door. One entire wall is plastered with photographs. From floor to ceiling, the images capture moments in time, spanning decades. The first photograph that catches my eye is a black and white image, probably from the early 1900s. It shows a bustling market square, with horse-drawn carriages and vendors peddling their goods. But towards the edge of the frame, standing slightly apart from the crowd, is the shadowy figure. It appears as a faint outline. Its edges are blurred, making it blend seamlessly with the shadows of the nearby buildings. Beside it, there's a sepia-toned photograph of a beach scene. Families are enjoying a sunny day, with children playing in the waves and couples lounging on blankets. Yet there it is again, the figure. It stands at the water's edge, almost as if it's gazing out at the horizon, lost in thought. Further up, an image from what looks like the 1950s shows a busy city street. In a narrow alley between two buildings, the figure is present, just a bit more defined than before. The depth of the shadow it casts hints at the midday sun, yet its face remains indiscernible, swallowed by the darkness. A more recent photograph, likely from the 1980s, depicts a playground. Children swing, slide, and play. Yet, near an old oak tree, the figure stands, watching. It's closer now, its form more tangible, and its shapes are more pronounced. Still, the features are frustratingly vague. In each image, regardless of the setting or era, the figure remains a constant. Its presence is both eerie and captivating. And as Jake and I inspect the photos, we can't shake off the feeling that it's been waiting for this very moment, for someone to finally notice it. As we continue examining the photographs, we're hit with the overwhelming realization that the figure isn't just passively existing in these scenes. It seems to be actively observing, as though it's been searching for something or someone. I think we need to find the most recent photos, Jake suggests, trying to mask the unease in his voice. I nod in agreement, and we begin to focus on the upper sections of the wall, hoping they might provide more recent glimpses into the figure's timeline. Among these, there's a photo that stands out. It's of this very house. The camera's perspective is from the street. The figure is there, standing at the front gate. That's here, right now, Jake says, pointing to the photo. He's right. The state of decay matches the current state of the house, suggesting the photo isn't old. As the weight of this realization sets in, a chill runs down my spine. If this photo is recent, then the figure could be close. I think we should leave, Jake whispers, his voice filled with urgency. Before I can respond, a sudden gust of wind sweeps through the hallway, slamming a door shut somewhere in the depths of the house. Goosebumps erupt on my arms and the air grows colder. But rather than feeling the urge to flee, I'm drawn to the closed door, needing to know what's behind it. With cautious steps, we approach the door. The earlier sounds of faint footsteps and whispering are replaced by a deafening silence. Every creak of the floorboard echoes in the empty house, amplifying our tension. I reach out, turn the doorknob slowly, and push the door open. Inside, the room is empty except for a table in the center. On the table is a lone photograph, face down. I walk over, pick it up, and turn it over in my hands. 
the image shows two figures standing in what appears to be this very room. My blood runs cold. It's us, with the shadowy figure looming behind us, closer than ever. The room's temperature seems to drop even further. Jake and I exchange a horrified glance. The message is clear. The figure knows we're here, and it's watching. Taking a deep breath to steady myself, I place the photograph back onto the table. We need to leave. Now. I whisper, my voice strained with a mix of fear and urgency. Jake nods, his face pale. Let's go. Quickly, but quietly. As we move towards the staircase, the house seems to come alive around us. The faint whispering returns, though I can't make out any distinct words. Descending the stairs, I can't shake off the feeling that we're being pursued. We finally reach the entrance and waste no time pushing the front door open. The outside air is a welcoming relief, a stark contrast to the stifling atmosphere inside. Once outside, we don't stop moving until we've put a significant distance between ourselves and the house. Only then do we dare to look back. The house stands silent and ominous. After catching our breath, Jake breaks the silence. That... that was something straight out of a horror story. What do you think that thing wants? I shake my head, attempting to collect my thoughts. I'm not sure, but... it's been observing for a long time, based on those photographs. Maybe it's trapped, or maybe it's seeking something, or someone. We need to get rid of it, Jake says suddenly his eyes fixated on the old camera in my hands. The weight of what we've experienced hangs heavy between us, and for the first time, the camera feels less like a treasure and more like a cursed object. I think you're right, I admit, looking at the camera with a newfound wariness. Jake takes a deep breath. It's clear that this isn't just some ordinary camera. The photographs, the house, the shadowy figure, it's all connected. We consider our options for a moment. Simply throwing it away doesn't feel sufficient given its mysterious and potentially dangerous nature. We need to destroy it, completely, Jake suggests. I was thinking the same thing. Fire might be our best bet, I say. With a plan in mind, we gather some dry wood and newspapers, creating a makeshift bonfire in a safe spot away from any trees. We place the camera in the center, as I light the fire, the flames quickly engulf the wood and then the camera. The heat is intense, and for a moment, it almost feels as though the camera is resisting, fighting to remain whole. But gradually it begins to melt, the plastic casing distorting and the metal parts glowing red hot. Jake and I stand there, watching silently as the fire consumes the camera, reducing it to ashes and molten metal. As the last remnants of the camera are consumed, a weight seems to lift off our shoulders. The oppressive feeling that had accompanied our discovery of the house and the shadowy figure starts to fade. After ensuring the fire is safely put out, Jake turns to me, with relief evident in his eyes. I think that's the end of that. I nod, feeling a mixture of exhaustion and closure. Yeah, let's just hope we've truly put an end to whatever that camera was tied to. We walk away from the ashes, leaving behind the remnants of a cursed object and hoping that its dark mysteries have been laid to rest.